Um, yeah, it's a pleasure for me for, to talk to you about volcanoes a little bit. Uh, completely different topic uh, here today. And, um, oh, I hope the battery is empty. Okay, let's try. Um, I want to start with a, a quote by, okay, one of my students said he must have been a volcanologist. Uh, Albert Einstein said, look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. If you replace nature by volcano crater, you are right in, uh, in the topic uh, where we are working at. And um, basically, if you are looking at a volcano, I think what uh, most of you um, know or have seen, maybe even directly seen, uh, are the products coming out. Um, like just uh, six years ago, we had uh, the ash encounter here also over Berlin. Air aircrafts were grounded. Um, many volcanoes uh, produce uh, pyroclastic flows. These are still the most threatening. So about 95% of all dead people at volcanoes are due to pyroclastic flows. But we understand or we start understanding that volcanoes have a very long preparation phase. And this is what we call the internal processes. And in textbooks, usually um, or quite often, internal structure of volcanoes are uh, described like that. Homogeneous with a straight path of magma coming up. And eventually, we see the eruption at the surface. And this is certainly not uh, the case. And um, how do we get an idea of what's going on under volcanoes? So very. Um, Traditional methods are ground-based methods. For instance, in seismology, you can install seismometers which record, um, for instance, uh, seismic waves, the shaking of the ground. And if you have more than two of these stations, you can even locate where this is coming from, from, for instance, a brittle fracture of a rock in the underground. And this gives us an indirect picture of the internal structure of a volcano. Same, you can use uh, geodesy, that means deformation measurements, or even chemistry. Uh, magmas start to degas at depth of 8, 9, 10 kilometers, and you see, for instance, changing gas contents at the surface long before magma arrives at the surface. Um, but these methods have some limitations also. Like here, for instance, the beautiful volcano uh, picture. Um, if you use these methods, you would try to go close to the volcano crater and uh, make your installation of your, uh, of your stations. But it may happen that very shortly after that, the volcano looks like that. This was in the Mount St. Helens in 1980s, a very prominent example of a very dramatic change uh, we may face with at volcanoes. And uh, with devastating effects up to 40 kilometers distance. Yeah. Um, you may say this is quite long ago, but this something like that happens every couple of years on Earth. Uh, a little bit later, this is on Montserrat uh, in the Antilles. And you see here the volcano Montserrat. I, Okay, when I'm witnessing or going to volcanoes, usually there are clouds, therefore you have to believe me. This was more or less the topography before it collapsed, and then it produced a pyroclastic flow, and this is now the crater as it happened. Now this is the top of the church here in the area. The uh, city of uh, Plymouth is abandoned since, uh, since that time, and there's no chance actually we are going to uh, uh, allow um, people to go move into this area again. Um, so also more recently, so what can we do to monitor uh, these changes at volcanoes? If I look at this Montserrat example, or before, from the 1980s, uh, the example, we have only before and after pictures. Obviously, there's a lot missing during these changes. And uh, this is the very challenging part uh, in uh, geology or in uh, geophysics we are facing here. We want to understand why and how volcanoes behave and from these uh, changes, we want to understand what is happening actually at depth. And in very few cases, you can observe volcano eruptions. Like this is an example from uh, Latin America, also where we have volcanoes, and nearby there are mountains. On top of the mountains, you can install instruments, remote instruments. We talk about remote sensing here. Um, for instance, a camera, a webcam. That's the cheapest one. Um, most volcano observatories can afford that. And from that, basically, you already get an idea about the structure of the crater. So like it's not only one crater, you see smaller craters. We talk about the nested crater then. And uh, if we then take an image uh, every hour, this is now a time-lapse movie from one month's time. I selected one image per day. You already say, see the dramatic changes uh, in the morphology at the volcano. And um, of course, I have to say this works very nice if the visibility is good. And uh, from such analysis using um, modern tools available in computer vision, we can estimate, for instance, 
growth rates, volumetric changes, analyze how much magma is coming out, and from this we can give in prognosis about the uh, forthcoming uh, dynamics. So this works if visibility is good, I said. But usually, you can imagine, during volcano crisis, visibility is not that good. And uh, here, just some examples, the same volcano, how it usually looks. And uh, the aim of our volcano monitoring and how we are trying to help observatories is to identify the changes in the subground, so in the subvolcanic changes, uh, the internal changes before and during eruptions. And this is a very challenging part, and we know very little what is happening at depth during an eruption. This was not only during the eruption on Iceland uh, six years ago. Uh, we were continuously asked, so what can you say about the future and what's happening at depth? Uh, we had no methods um, during this time. So new methods are coming up, and here in very close collaboration with DLR in Oberpfaffenhofen, we work with uh, radar methods. Uh, this is, for instance, the German uh, Terrasa X uh, satellite. Um, and uh, radar technologies in space have the big um, advantage. These are active sensors, so they are transmitting an electromagnetic wave. And we are receiving an echo after some time and can analyze this uh, echo. And uh, this has been very successful in almost all fields in geoscience, uh, from the ice or cryosphere to biosphere and, and geosphere analysis. And uh, also other space agencies, like the Japanese Space Agency, uh, are catching up on that. And now um, Europe, the European Space Agency, has launched now Sentinel-1. Two days ago, Sentinel-1B, a second instrument, was launched and is operating now. And uh, in Germany, um, here within the Helmholtz centers, uh, there's a big alliance which, where I'm leading the geosphere. And there we are designing our wish tool, which we may want to have maybe in some time. What we can do with that, because it's active, we are looking even at the ground during night, during day, and because of the wavelength, which, which is on the order of centimeters to decimeters, we can look through uh, eruption clouds and then see how, continuously see how craters change in time. And um, we are not lo only looking at the, at the amplitude change and all the char characteristics of these craters, but um, for instance, use also interferometry and interferometric technique. The idea here is that uh, the electromagnetic wave has a phase and amplitude entity, and the phase entity, this is here described by this one, um, is dependent firstly on the reflectivity of the ground, then of course the, the travel distance, so the two-way travel distance, because the signal is uh, re um, received uh, back from, from the ground, and atmospheric phase contribution and something which is called here noise. And uh, now consider that we have two um, acquisitions. So the same satellite revolves around the Earth and takes another image during a different time from the same ground. And maybe then the volcano has moved or the ground has moved a little bit. Then we can look at the interferometric phase. So basically the difference between these two. And this is what we have done some years ago in, uh, in the Andes. It's a very remote area, very well suited for us because there are many volcanoes. And we thought, let's test if we see some volcano deformation here. This strip is about 80, 90 kilometers wide. So we, you see about uh, 40 different volcanoes. There's one, there's one, there are also smaller volcanoes on it. And uh, we were depressed when we saw that because there was no eminent deformation or big signal. And uh, we tried this a little bit later and then we saw that. And this is a deformation signal. We know the wavelength of the, uh, of the instrument, we know when the acquisition was, and then we can calculate the amount of movement of the ground towards the satellite. Here in this case, we have now a movement of about 1.8 centimeters per year. The distance is a little bit scary. It's about 60, 50, 60 kilometers in diameter, uh, or 2,000 square kilometers, so whole Berlin would fit into that. So we have not an individual volcano which is inflating, but a very big volcano which is uh, deforming there. And um, so these sensors can be used not only to identify these big guys here, like that, but also to look on a very small scale, like individual volcanoes, um, where we have very high resolution information now on the changes on the ground. Here in this case, you have an uplift. In this case, we have more sidewards uh, movement of the ground. So what does it mean? 
actually. If we have such data, um, we can use it to get an idea about the internal structure. And if you ask a volca volcanologist what you would like to do or what you would like to be, he would say maybe that he is becoming a plumber because volcanologists talk about a plumbing system in the underground. This is where magma, before it's erupting, is actually stored. And uh, in a simple picture, um, the storage is in a sort of balloon or a chamber or something like that, where uh, the pressure is building up. And this pressure build up is shown by a inflation or upward movement. And this we can measure now using these nice techniques. So from these measurements, we have, for instance, as a function of distance, the vertical amplitude or pattern of deformation, but also the horizontal one. And uh, these two entities give us very exact or precise information about the depth, the volume change, uh, the pressure change also at depth. So these are the informations we are looking at. And the same during an eruption now, when an eruption occurs, some volume from, the, from this magma balloon escapes, and we see it shrinking by a deformation which is maybe reversed or has some other characteristics than the inflation sign. So we talk about inflation and deflation. And this is what we are starting to do now at a number of volcanoes. This is a volcano in, uh, in Mexico. And you see here just uh, the interferometric phase from the satellite data around the summit. And uh, the ground stations are located here. They are very cost if, um, intensive. You have to go there, visit, do maintenance. And uh, in this case, they even missed the deformation signal. And um, this deformation signal then we analyze using numerical models, for instance, finite element, finite difference, or boundary element models, and try to optimize uh, the, the source. A source is the, uh, the reason for the deformation we see at the, at the surface. In this particular case, we couldn't uh, simulate the same deformation in your, our models using just a simple geometry. Obviously, it was something more complex, maybe with two reservoirs which were inflating shortly before the eruption and deflating again after the eruption. And this is very important to uh, make better uh, forecasts for volcano eruptions. So this is the case now what we think is going on at uh, this particular volcano. We have not only one big balloon, we have a plexus or a combination of different smaller balloons where magma is stored. And uh, using even better data, we may maybe in the future see how magma is going from one reservoir to the other one before we see uh, the eruption at the surface. So, but not all volcanoes look like that picture. There are some volcanoes which have a completely different scale, like the, like the one I showed at the beginning. Um, where, for instance, this scale might be about five kilometer, but others, we may have a different topography, but also craters which are 10 kilometers or even larger. And obviously there, the plumbing system is something different. And uh, there was uh, a very lucky situation for us on Iceland again, just one and, one and a half years ago. Uh, this was the eruption of Badabunga, um, a volcano which uh, many of the uh, volcanologists didn't really have on their radar. And uh, it's because it didn't have an eruption since uh, quite a long time. And this is an airplane photograph. You see here an eruption and there an eruption. So obviously there were two sites where magma was coming out. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, it was erupting about two uh, cubic kilometers. So it's a quite big volume. And uh, it was about 10 times bigger than the eruption which was uh, closing the airspace over, over Europe. And uh, actually, as, we, as I will show you in the next slide, it initiated under the thickest ice we have uh, on Iceland. Um, from deformation data, we could identify that there was an uh, opening of a crack and this was obviously the path of the magma. And this could be also simulated using uh, models, computer simulations. Um, here, just for scale, these two red uh, stars, these are the two eruptions. We are looking at the profile and here calculate how much at this profile a crack was opening. And the opening was up to six meters here in places. But the interesting thing, which was published, published in Nature also, was that the crack was much larger than what you see here, actually. It was continuing for over 30, 35 kilometers. And where did it come from? It came from this guy here. This is um, part of the, of, of the biggest glacier on Iceland. Here on Google Earth map, you see here the Vatnajökull glacier. 
And there is a flat plateau, and obviously underneath this flat plateau, there is this Badabunga volcano sitting. Yeah? And uh, during the eruption, this Badabunga was not so happily sitting around. It was obviously reacting, causing a subsidence here, and we saw earthquakes going up to the north here, and we had an eruption next to the ice shield. This hole is the ice shield. And we believe that if there were an eruption under the ice shield, then we would have had another very significant ash uh, encounter here again. We just published this in uh, Science. Uh, so if you look that, uh, at that in this sketchy image again, so obviously there are some volcanoes where magma doesn't want to go up for some reason, but we have very far lateral uh, propagation of tens of kilometers before an eruption is occurring. And this is actually our, our uh, progress or our our concept to study in the next years to understand why some volcanoes behave like that and some like that. We have some rough ideas. So one idea is uh, that the stress field in the Earth's crust plays a major role, but this has to be further examined. And uh, with that, I would like to leave you. I would like to thank uh, my team at, at the GFZ in Potsdam. And many of the results have been done by Jackie Salzer and Mehdi, Mehdi Nico, who is also here in the, here in the room. And uh, I, it's fascinating to work with a very enthusiastic and young team. Thank you. <laughs>